when I was a child, um, I can remember as far back as six years old, being interested in birds and anything that moved around, and living in Nairobi in Kenya as I did, that's where I was brought up, um, there was a lot of things to look at. My parents came from Glasgow in Scotland, luckily for me, um, but they came to Kenya and they stayed there. My father was in the army at the end of the Second World War and they got married in Nairobi <coughs> and myself, sister and brother were brought up there and uh, it's from the age of seven everyone began to realize that they had this rather strange kid um, on their hands who just didn't really care about anything especially school and <coughs> I was interested in birds and animals and snakes and everything and eventually my my father took me to the museum one day at the age of seven to meet the birdman, uh, the ornithologist there a guy called John Williams, who was probably more responsible for his enth enthusiasm into my life than anybody. Anyway, um, I ended up going to him a lot, and he taught me how to skin and prepare birds in the museum. And I used to go off collecting birds around Nairobi, which was a lot of bush in those days, and took them to him, and he made me skin some. And it got to the point where our, our school was about a kilometer up the road, and uh, <coughs> myself and two other guys used to ride there on bikes and I got to the point where I used to tell my friends please can you just tell the teacher that I'm sick today and I used to turn around and go back to the museum and spend the day at the school hours in the museum well that was okay until a couple of times the headmistress phoned up my mother uh, and in those days it was those old telephones with a hand deal and um, said, you know, we're very sorry that Robert's sick, uh, you know, he's not at school today. So she said, you know, what do you mean he's not at school? He went to school this morning. Well, that was fine until you got home. And then your mother standing there waiting and you know you're in trouble. And I uh, said, you know, where were you today? So <clears throat> after a lot of humming and hawing without actually telling lies, I uh, got a slap around the back of the head and that was it. But that became a reasonably regular deal. Anyway, at the age of um, 14, um, well, in fact, just before that, at the age of 11 or 12, no, 12, I went to um, the high school, so-called, but I hadn't taken the exam to go in. And so the, um, <coughs> the headmaster was sitting talking to my father, and the headmaster gave me a, a, a mathematics paper, a little few things to do to see where to put me in the school. And he gave me a, an algebra set of questions, which to me was like Greek. You know. um, I knew how to write it out, and that was it. Anyway, so I, um, I wrote this out beautifully in the, on another table while he spoke with my father, gave it back to him and he looked at this and he must have been quite impressed because he put me in a class with some geniuses. And um, I'm in the way over my head. The first words that I heard were trigonometry um, and logarithms. I didn't know what that was except a page full of numbers. So it ended up there that I used to spend a little bit of my time in the, in the class, especially mathematics, drawing pictures of birds. Uh, and at one point when I was caught out, a nude woman. And that, very small in my, in my math book. <coughs> anyway, I was evicted from that class, put into a lower class. Uh, and that was fine. So anyway, that's how life went on. And then at the age of 14, um, I left school. I had much better things to do and I knew which direction I wanted to go in. And I think the one thing that I would always say is that, um, uh, and it's been my own experience, is that kids ought to follow their passion in life. You know, everybody's drummed into going to school to do this and this and this and this and, and their kid's passion is pushed aside. They learn all these funny things that we all had to learn. Um, and then they have to have a degree or they're no one. And so it, it's squashing what our society really has in it, in, in terms of essence. Anyway, so I, I just pushed on with that and I've told my kids the same and they more or less followed that. But um, at the age of 14 I started working and I used to get um, in a safari business uh, owned by a, a, a friend of my father's. And I went on in that for two years and I was paid £20 a month. That was my salary, which I handed over to my mum and dad uh, because I was still living there. <coughs> and then um, I, I kept on preparing specimens and drawing and painting and that sort of thing. My bedroom was full of birds and snakes and I don't know what, my parents were terrified to go in my room. So then uh, 
um, the next big decision came, which was probably one of the more interesting in my life. <coughs> um, I had been involved with a guy from the museum going out on trips collecting birds and so on. And that was one direction I was going and my art was my direction. And then I was taken on a safari for two months uh, with two hunters that I knew. Um, I was the, four, nearly 15 and uh, the, their client was the Shah of Persia's brother uh, and the princess and her sister and her husband. Uh, only one of them could speak English but they were hunting and we went to Tanzania, Tanganyika as it was in those days and my job on the trip was to collect birds for the Shah's brother. His name was Abdurreza Panabi and His Highness and so um, <coughs> I went on the trip, had a great time, did what I had to do and then at the end of the trip the prince said to me he wanted me to go to Iran to stay in the palace it was before they were all deposed stay in the palace and make a collection of Iranian birds for him uh, to put in his trophy room for six months at the same time I was accepted uh, in Denver in Colorado for uh, a three-year apprenticeship with a very famous taxidermist and animal sculptor called Coleman Jonas uh, the family still working in the same business I think and uh, he came to America in 1903 anyway he was 76 when I got there but so my decision had to be go to Iran and stay in a palace uh, with a prince and then collect birds for six months or do what I was really being pulled to is my art in Denver which is what I did so Coleman Jonas kicked me around almost literally for um, three years and he was a tyrant but a master and he knew exactly what you had to look at what to learn how to learn how to learn how to see the essence in animals and things <coughs> and so I did that and during that I saved enough money to go back to Kenya by boat it was four hundred dollar on a, on a uh, freight ship anyway I think three days uh, three, three days before my um, trip back I got a, a ticket from my father sent over because you know communication from Africa to America in those days wasn't that easy. He sent me a ticket to fly back uh, which was a lot for him to, to, to be able to do that. So I went out and I spent $400 that I had on all sorts of funny things, camera and various things like that. Went back and, and anyway that was the end of my training and so from there on um, I've, I've always been in my life involved in uh, birds obviously. Uh, mammals, small mammals, um, and I've done a lot of museum expeditions around Cameroon, Madagascar, uh, all over Western Uganda, Ethiopia, Sudan, um, and so um, I've done that. But in amongst it all, all was my art, and I had again had many uh, pulls to do that professionally full time. Um, and then in 1969, I said, I'm going to go on with my artwork. Um, and I was making animals, carving animals in, in clay and in res making them in resin and stuff like that. And then I decided uh, in 69 to make something in bronze. And so uh, I left everything else and I just went full time on that. And so um, I sold a car that I, I'd made an elephant, not very big. And I sold a car, a Volkswagen of all things. Um, didn't get much money, but it was enough to get me to London uh, by plane take my elephant to be cast in bronze at a foundry that I've been introduced to, um, get back in the plane and go back home with the elephant when it was ready and that was the end of my money. And it just so happened that a lady was on safari with a friend of mine in Kenya, saw the unfinished model um, and um, said she wanted the first one. I, I make ten in an edition. She wanted the first one. Well it ended up that she was in London at the same time I arrived with the elephant, saw the elephant finished in clay uh, and then said to me uh, I think you might need this and I was terrified to ask for a deposit so um, she just gave me a bit of paper which was a check for the full amount three thousand dollars well I nearly dropped the elephant you know I couldn't believe that anyway so that was it and that got me rolling um, and going on and on and on is a long story but um, I think just jumping way ahead now we myself and my partner Sue live in the bush we always have studying animals from life, not using photographs. And that way we're getting the essence of the animal direct to you um, 
and it, it just gives something, something different because you're understanding what, how the animal breathes and lives and looks and all kinds of things. <coughs> so we spend our lives, and I, ha I have always, um, working direct from, from whatever the subject is. And so the more you go on, the more difficult it becomes really because you realize how little you actually know about anything. You know, <laughs> when you're, a young, when you're quite young, you think you know a lot, but um, you realize that we're just scratching the surface. So I want to keep scratching surfaces and uh, keep trying. I uh, don't know how much time's left, but um, it, you know, it works. And then uh, going back a bit, then um, when I started my bronzes, Ben Carpenter, who um, I did the horses for, he used to come to um, Kenya on safari with a friend of mine hunting in those days. And uh, the guy that he went with, uh, Bunny Allen, well-known professional hunter, brought him to my studio in those days and said, uh, you know, showed him my smaller bronzes. Well, Ben started buying pieces from me, small pieces, and um, that's how I met Ben Carpenter. And then one day I was over here on a trip and um, uh, at, at a conference, a uh, game convention actually, showing some bronzes. Came out here to visit Ben at their ranch house, and in those days Las Colinas was a ranch. Um, it had, had uh, the lakes had been put in and a few roads, Bennigan's restaurant and, and Byron Nelson golf course, a few little things like that. And so we're sitting having a coffee and Ben, he, he'd had an operation and he was recuperating but he, he just said he'd like to have a herd of horses running through some water. Well, he actually said jumping over water. And uh, would, would I be interested in doing it? So I said, yeah. And I didn't realize how big a water, we hadn't talked about that. And so I, he was coming to Kenya in two months uh, on another trip. <coughs> so he said, you go home and do some drawing. And uh, when, when you've done the drawings, I'm coming on a trip, I'll come and look and we'll talk. Well, instead of doing drawings, I made some little horses like that. And I also worked out that a herd of horses is normally about six animals. If you see a lot of horses together, it's normally several herds. So. <coughs> um, I, uh, I made these little horses and, and a pool of water because I thought horses jumping over with water it wasn't very good so I had them running through it. Well, well he came with his wife Betty and while the girls talked uh, we went in my studio and I, I don't know if you ever knew Ben but he, he didn't, know, didn't say a lot um, and he was a very humble guy but he just he knew what he wanted and so he stood in front of this little model of six horses and didn't say a word and I thought well, you know something wrong. and. Uh, he just stood there looking and looking and looking and it was quite a while. And then he said, you know, <coughs> I, I, I can actually use his accent a wee bit, but he, he said, you know, Rob, he said, we need to put another horse here and another horse here and another horse here. And that made it nine. So I said, wait a minute, Ben. I said, just, you know, can we just sit and talk? So we went in my little office and said, I said to him, you know, you said nine horses. Have you any idea what that is going to cost and I said do you want them in concrete or in uh, resin which you can make look like bronze or in real bronze he said they had to be in real bronze because they had to last forever and at that point I thought they were going somewhere on the ranch you know um, I don't know, didn't know anything about it so uh, he, he said they had to last forever and I, I again said to him have you any idea what that might cost and he his words were we'll build it in somehow so I said okay well then, the, the interesting thing is that um, he then I made a another larger scale model, full with the, the plaza and everything, but you know miniature scale. It was 15 by 15 feet, and with water and fountains from fish tanks. Um, and he flew for the night with the um, the engineer and architect of the plaza and the buildings, a guy called Jim Reeves, who I worked a lot with. And I gather Jim just died recently. But um, anyway, so Jim came out for one night all the way from here to Kenya, looked at the uh, model, and Ben said, those are the horses, now you design the buildings around them. I mean, that's pretty good going to do it that way around. Most people build everything and then ask an artist to, to do something. And so um, that, that's, that's how that bit came about. So then when I heard there was going to be a 28-story building, and two, I think, they're 13 stories, uh, if you put a life-size horse in there, it's nothing. It's very small because of these big buildings. And so what I, I did is I, 
I had a trick that I used. Um, I did a, a drawing of the rearing stallion, uh, about that big, you know, not, not big at all. And I put that on a, a stand, put a big sheet of polystyrene on the wall behind it. And then I went back with a flashlight and I moved the shadow of the cutout onto the, onto the polystyrene. When I got it to what I figured was one and a half times life size, um, I then cut it out. Now downtown Nairobi there's a, an area that's about the size of the plaza, it's probably bigger but with big buildings and so on. And so I wanted to put that cut out there and it was funny because all the security guys and everyone didn't know what I was up to. I carried this cut out horse painted black out and put it there. Anyway I went way back and I just looked and it worked amongst these buildings. And so I decided to go one and a half. And I mean, I'd never done it before, and so it was quite interesting. And then uh, I, I went ahead and made the models. Uh, next thing was half life size models. And then um, we, I, I personally made the big models in England near the foundry in a studio. And we cast each one as I'd finished it uh, because of the timing of the whole thing. And then um, we flew them here in a 747 American Airlines, which was quite interesting. And then we, we, the buildings here weren't quite finished, but uh, they, um, they, the, luckily they had one of these big building cranes right there. And so they were able to lift the horses off flatbed trucks and put them on 8,000 pound concrete bases on each horse into the riverbed. And that was all marked out uh, by the engineers and put them in there. And then eventually put the fountains in, which I designed and flooded the water in, because I, I designed the river as well. And, and basically that was it, but it's a very long operation. It took, um, including the installation, uh, eight, eight and a half years of my life. And that's all I did. I didn't do anything else. And so since then it's been animals and more animals and working with animals and living in the bush. And it's uh, just pretty amazing existence.